Okay, so we will continue our lecture with the uh, just finish with prostate cancer and then we are done with um, we also um, did benign prostate hypertrophy so you continue with cervical cancer cervical cancer I think the last time we did anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system so we know where the service is located right so let's assume that this is the female reproductive organ. So we have the uterus. We have the uterus. Then the cervix, and then the vagina. Right. So the cervix most of the time forms the lower one third of the uterus. Right. So the cervix is at the entrance of the uterus, right, and then the vagina most of the time projects into the cervix at right angles, right, so as you can see from the board, and then if you look at the whole, uh, the length of the whole uterus is about seven centimeters, so the cervix alone takes about 2.5 centimeters, right, the length of the cervix is about 2.5 centimeters. And as you can see from the board, yeah, so I was saying that, I was saying that the service forms the lower one third of the uterus, right? So if this whole thing is the uterus, the service starts from this part and then ends at this part, right? So it forms the lower, one third of the uterus, so it's at the lower part of the uterus. And then I also said that the whole uterus, the length is seven centimeters, right? So the cervix takes about 2.5 centimeters out of the seven centimeters. And then with the cervix, as you can see from the board, there are two openings, right? We have the internal os of the cervix, internal os and then the external os, right? So doing by palpation, if you do vagina examination, you can only feel, right, during labor, if the midwife want to check how many centimeters the woman have dilated, right? You can only feel the external os, right, to check whether from whether it's between one to 10 centimeters. And then, so the external os is at the opening into the, it opens into the vagina, whilst the internal os opens into the uterus, right? And then most of the time, cancer can occur at the cervix. There can be abnormal proliferation of the cells of the cervix, which is known as cervical cancer, right? And then cervical cancer accounts for about one tenth of all cancer deaths in women. Right? So if you run um, cancers among women, cervical cancer is one of the commonest. Right? And it usually arises from the squamous cell on the outside of the uterine cervix. Right? So if you look at it, we say that the service projects into the vagina, right? So at the junction, we have the junction where the uterus and then the vagina meets. We call it the scramo-columna junction. Scramo-columna junction. And that is the part where cervical cancer normally occurs. Uh, that is the scramo columnar junction. That is the part where cervical cancer normally occurs. Right? It is the, is the third most common cancer of the female reproductive system. Right? Even if you read other articles, you will say that it is the second most common cancer of the female reproductive system. And then it's most articles also say that it's the first leading cause of death among women, right? Because if we are ranking breast cancer 
is round face. But if you look at the reproductive system, breast, breast is just an accessory reproductive organ. So it's not part of the main reproductive structure. Okay. So let's look at um, signs and symptoms of cervical cancer. Right? So if you are a woman and then you have some of these signs, you should not take it um, as something that is normal. You should go to the hospital and then so that other tests can be done. Right, so the first one is painless vaginal spotting. So when all of a sudden you are not menstruating, but you see trickling of blood in your panties, you have to visit the hospital. And then post-coital bleeding is also one of the manifestations of cervical cancer. Post-coital bleeding, where the, the woman will bleed after sexual intercourse, right? It's not when the woman is a virgin with you. We are talking about someone who have not been having this and all of a sudden she have intercourse and then start bleeding. Irregular uh, menstrual bleeding is also one um, of the clinical manifestations. And then sometimes they have vaginal discharge, that is, um, it's, it's it, it smells bad, right? So it has a bad smell. So with that, the, and this is most of the time, the bleeding after sex and then the and vagina discharge, right? That most of the time have a bad smell. That is what most of the time bring women to the hospital. Right? But don't wait to get to this thing before you come to the hospital. And then sometimes they start having pelvic pain and then dyspareunia, where they have a um, painful sexual intercourse. Right? So these are clinical manifestations. And then late, late signs and symptoms include leg pain, anorexia, weight loss, leakage of urine and feces from the vagina, dysuria, hematuria, anemia, rectal bleeding, etc. These are late stages where the cancer has progressed, right? So sometimes there are metastasis to other organs that are used, right? What are the risk factors for cervical cancer? Aging is one of the risk factors, aging. So as you age, you are prone, as a woman, you are prone to having or getting cervical cancer. And then family history is one of them. And then Human papilloma virus infection. That research have associated or linked HPV to cervical cancer, right? Especially the type 16 and 18. Right? There are several of the human papilloma virus, but the one that is linked to cervical cancer is the type 16 and 18. And then women who have sexual intercourse before the age of 17 are also prone to this condition, right? So first sexual intercourse, and nowadays they are, they, most of them are even having sexual intercourse. Before 13 years or at the age of 13, people are having sexual intercourse. So um, it means that the incidence will keep rising, right? if you don't change some of these lifestyle. And then having multiple sexual partners, yes. So you think that you are smart, so you can just change partners like that, yes. Um, one of the risk factors is also having multiple. So most of the time, men can carry the virus, right? But because men do not have service, it doesn't really cause any harm. But once it's, they are being transmitted to the woman, it can cause problems, right? Like genital was cervical cancer, etc. And then having sexual intercourse with uncircumcised men also increases your risk. And then smoking. Smoking is also um, another risk factor. Obesity, um, multiple pregnancies, um, etc can increase your risk to cervical cancer. Prolonged use of oral contraceptives, family history, etc. Okay, 
So we've talked about science and symptom diagnostic investigation, um, science and symptoms, and then we just talk about the risk factors. Let's look at diagnostic investigations. We have um, an investigation known as corposcopy, corposcopy, which is done to assess or examine the service to detect any changes, whether there is hyper of the cells, etc. Then cervical biopsy, a biopsy can also be taken. At the, most of the time, a speculum is used to open the vagina and then the biopsy is taken to do the vagina at the service and then it's examined to detect any changes. And then pap smear test, which is done every three years in women who are at the age of 21 years and above. And it's advisable that after your first sexual intercourse, you should go for pap smear, right? And then most of the time now, there is a vaccine for women who, um, who go for the test and then they are, they, 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 they are not affected by the virus. By their virus free. So a vaccine can be given to these women. And then women who have never had sex before, most of the time they are given the vaccine for life, right? Three shots for life. But women who have ever had sex, even if they don't have the virus, are expected to go come for a reboost at the within five years interval. Right. Okay. So the pap smear test is given every three years in women um, between the ages of 21 years. And as I've said, it's advisable that after your first sexual intercourse, women, a woman who have had, had sex before to go for this test, right? Because the virus can only be transmitted through sexual intercourse. And then HPV testing. Right, every five years, you can do it together with at the age of 30, it can be done together with a pap test and then um, ultrasound MRI and um, chest x ray because sometimes it can metastasize to other organs. Those who can stop having pap tests, women who can stop having pap tests are women who have had. Total hysterectomy, right? So the uterus is removed. And then women who are 65 to 70 years who have had no abnormal tests in the last 10 years. And then women who um, corposcopic test is normal. And then so these women can stop having the pap test, but it will be advised by the doctor anyway. Um, complications of cervical cancer, most of the time, it can metastasize to the uterus, the fallopian tube, the ovaries, and other organs. And it can lead to infertility if not treated. So it's, it's important to take it serious. Right? And it's now common among women. Right? So every woman at the age of 20 or who have had a first sexual intercourse is expected to go for the screening and then the vaccine where applicable. Okay, so the surgical operation that is done for women with cervical cancer, we can do colonization, right? That is when it has now started. And then um, hysterectomy can also be done when the cancer has spread or in a woman who is not expected to give birth again, right? So we do hysterectomy to prevent the cancer from spreading, right? Okay. Um, we can also do pelvic exaggeration, right? It depends on the spread of the cancer, where sometimes it's not only the uterus and the cervix, but sometimes the bladder, the rectum, and other organs are removed. Right. Okay. So with the I've mentioned the colonization, right, which is the minor type, and sometimes cryosurgery, which is also 
a minor type, which the cancer have now started. But where it has spread to the whole uterus, total hysterectomy may be done, right? Which can be done through the vagina or total abdominal hysterectomy. Or sometimes radical hysterectomy. With a radical hysterectomy, the uterus is removed, the cervix is removed, sometimes part of the vagina is removed, and some ligaments are also removed, right? And then, depending on the spread, sometimes the ovaries, the fallopian tube, can also be removed in addition. But modified radical hysterectomy is a surgery that is done to remove the uterus, the cervix, the upper part of the vagina, the ligaments, right, and the lymph nodes, right. But sometimes the fallopian tube and other organs may be left. Okay. Um, let's look at um, the management, like pre-op management and then post-op management for a person going for hysterectomy. Or, yeah, so most of the time, the surgery is hysterectomy. So let's look at a pre-op and then the post-op management. Right, so break off physical. The, the person can be given laxatives, right, to clear the GI. Right, so enema laxatives may be given. And then antibiotics may be prescribed three to five days before the surgery, right, as prophylaxis to prevent infection. Right, and then two to 24 hours before the surgery, the person can be given low residue diet and then within 24 hours you can give the person a good diet before the ninth to the surgery the person is placed on meal per or snatching by mouth right and then proper perineal hygiene is also done to prevent infection and then with the um, physical preparation to as um, psychological preparation is very important to educate or prepare the woman psychologically right so if the woman has given birth then and mostly with cervical cancer where hysterectomy is done it means that the condition has advanced so you have to tell the woman the need for the woman to go for the surgery and then we have we also have to tell the woman that the surgery is the only op option right and if they don't go for it it means that it will spread to other organs and it will cause complications, right? So psychologically, you have to prepare the woman for, and especially if the woman has already given birth, then you can use that one as a form of encouragement or reassurance to the, the woman, right? And then um, you also have to talk about pain control measures and all that, and then involve the husband and other family members. Right. Okay. And then post-operatively, post most of the time, patient is usually nursed in the intensive care unit for three to four days after the surgery. Right. So patient is nursed in the intensive care unit. Right. It's a major surgery. So most of the time, they can stay there for about three to four days. Right. A wood drainage tubes may be kept in place and are tied to a low suction. Right, so they may come from the theater with the wound we need to, and as nurses we should manage it as we did the last time. And then they should be on nail pair or for about four to six days. Right, so people after who have gone for hysterectomy should be on nail pair or for about four to six days. So nothing by mouth. So it is that you should be given IV fluids and then you should manage the patient on intake and output charts and then you should assess for signs of distension abdominal distension and all that um, and then let's look at how you prevent um, cervical cancer most of the time is prevented by being faithful to your partner not engaging in sexual intercourse before um, the age of 21, 
right? Since we've said that early sexual intercourse is linked to cervical cancer, right? Having intercourse below 18 years is linked to cervical cancer. Then the use of condom, if you can't abstain, so abstinence is the best, but if you can't abstain, the use of condom is also advised. Then I've said that being faithful to your partner. And then going for the cervical cancer screening is also important for early detection of the cancer and then prevention of the cancer. Okay, so this is very important.